Tonight's speaker is Dr. Blake Perkins. Blake is a seventh generation Ozarker and an Arkansas native who grew up near Smithville on a cattle farm along the Strawberry River in western Lawrence and eastern Sharp counties. After graduating from Lynn Public High School, now Hillcrest, in 2004, he went on to earn an undergraduate degree in history at Lyon College in 2008 and a master's degree in history from Missouri State University in 2010, where he studied under the eminent Ozarks historian Brooks Blevins. Perkins earned a PhD in history at West Virginia University in 2014, where he worked under the guidance of Appalachian and US working class historian Ken Phones Wolf. Since 2014, Perkins has taught history at Williams Baptist University in Walnut Ridge, where I'm from, <laughs> where he also serves as chair of the Department of History and Political Science. He lives in Lynn with his wife, Jody, and their two boys, Maddox and Rylan. He is a member of the Arkansas Historical Association's Board of Trustees and is also a proud board member of the Friends of the Arkansas State Archives. He has published articles and reviews in numerous journals, including the Arkansas Historical Quarterly, the Missouri Historical Review, History of Education Quarterly, and Elder Mountain, a Journal of Ozark Studies. His book, Hillbilly Hellraisers, Hellraisers, Federal Power and Populist Defiance in the Ozarks, was published at the University of Illinois work, Press's Working Class in American History series in the fall of 2017. Please help me welcome Dr. Blake Perkins. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you uh, to the State Archives. I really appreciate the invitation to be here and for the friends. Um, as you're going to see, I've got some photographs in a minute. Uh, I use the State Archives a lot uh, for the research for this book, and so um, a great, great, uh, great institution we have there. In September 1897, National and regional newspapers reported on the killing of two U.S. deputy marshals in the Arkansas Ozarks. Determined to quash illicit distillers, Marshals B.F. Taylor and Joe Dodson had led a small raiding party into northeastern Pope County, a place described by the Arkansas Gazette as one of the wildest regions imaginable, remote from the centers of civilization. There, desperate mountaineers always stood ready to resist the invading arm of the law, the Gazette continued. According to the New York Times, when the marshals came within 30 yards of one of the largest stills in the mountains, they walked into an ambush, and the unerring aim of the lawless mountaineers made short work of them. The torrents of gunfire killed Taylor and Dodson on the spot and wounded two others before the unseen moonshiners escaped from the scene. In the ensuing days, authorities and the wealthy Taylor family of Searcy County offered a sizable reward for the capture and conviction of the guilty parties. More than a year later, officials finally nabbed their key suspect, a farmer from Van Buren County named Harve Bruce. Such sensational scuffles between moonshiners and federal lawmen in the southern mountains seem at first glance to illuminate an exceptional culture of unbending anti-government attitudes a cultural ethos assumed to have remained unchanged in rural isolation, an unmovable tradition since the first pioneers settled the region in the early 1800s. Tales of doggedly independent moonshiners resisting the feds have probably contributed more than anything to shaping assumptions about a government-defying rural culture. But, as historians and other scholars of the Mountain South have often argued, such imagined cultural imagery often tells us more about those who narrate the stories than the realities of the hill folks themselves. Probing beneath the myths that have shrouded the 1897 affair in Pope County reveals that the burdens of an increasingly uneven rural political economy had much more to do with Harv Bruce's and his fellow moonshiner farmers resistance than some timeless anti-government culture. Rural Ozarkers like Bruce who made moonshine resisted particular government regulations and law enforcement because they felt unjustly prohibited from pursuing an agricultural and entrepreneurial pursuit that they thought held the best promise for sustaining their way of life and prospering as family farmers in increasingly opportunity-strapped hill communities. As was the case for distillers plying their trade in the Great Smoky Mountains back east, the story of moonshine, notes historian Daniel Pierce, is a story of how people of little 
and often worsening means, tried to find ways to cope with the difficulties of life. Contrary to the dominant view of the moonshine wars as primarily clashes between parochial rural denizens and government outsiders or foreigners, intruding into local affairs with their distant bureaucratic agendas, a closer look at the violent altercation in Pope County more accurately reflects a contest for power between locals within the region amid the unevenness of Gilded Age America. Bruce and his moonshining comrades resented most the likes of local elites such as Taylor and Dodson, two privileged Ozarkers from well-to-do families whose business and political connections had landed them their salaried positions in the U.S. Marshal Service, and John T. Burris of Russellville, the prominent and well-connected mill owner who, in the first place, had traveled to Little Rock to pressure H.L. Remmel, the head collector of the IRS in Arkansas, to dispatch federal lawmen to clean up the still-infested mountains of Pope County. Harv Bruce's and other Ozark moonshiners' defiance is best understood when put in the context of the more radical strands of grassroots resistance unleashed amid the broader populist political ethic that swept the region during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These were no conservative defenders of small government orthodoxy. Far from it. Thousands of Ozark smallholders had joined organizations such as the Brothers of Freedom in the 1880s, which vowed to advocate for common working folks and defending against big moneyed interests who, quote, uh, who propose not only to live on the labors of others, but to speedily amass fortunes at their expense. The Brothers of Freedom and similar groups in the region had morphed into the National Farmers Alliance by the 1890s, a self-described union of labor forces that counted about 100,000 rural Arkansas as members and declared in its 1892 political platform, we believe that the power of government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded as rapidly and as far as the good sense of an intelligent people and the teachings of experience shall justify to the end that oppression, injustice, and poverty shall eventually cease in the land. Defying assumptions about rural people's traditional dread of federal power, the Alliance's list of demands included the creation of progressive income taxes to be levied on corporations and the wealthy, a government takeover of transportation and communications industries, including the railroads, a liberal expansion of the national monetary supply, strong regulations to curb absentee land ownership and speculation in agricultural real estate, and a sub-treasury plan in which the federal government would build and manage a network of warehouses where farmers could store commodities for collective marketing and obtain low-interest loans through the U.S. Treasury Department. Alliance members also proposed direct elections for U.S. Senators and endorsed an eight-hour workday for industrial workers. After the populist political tide subsided in the mid and late 1890s, thousands of rural Ozarkers continued on as members of the National Farmers Union, <clears throat> which political scientist Elizabeth Sanders says was, quote, the, probably the broadest and most progressive of any grassroots organization of the early 1900s. Hundreds of rural Ozarkers also organized and joined local chapters of the Socialist Party. Really? Yeah. Asking by what rule of truth, right, or justice has any other person to a, a right to labor's production and drawing on a conceptual combination of Republican ideals expressed in the Declaration of Independence, the moral teachings of Jesus Christ, and the political theories of Karl Marx. So then, these were not the hard-shell, anti-government mountaineers simplistically depicted in much of Ozark's legend and lore. In this gilded age of concentrating wealth, growing inequality, and rural dispossession, most working-class Ozarkers demand a good cleaning out of the rich and powerful from government institutions and what they called a restoration of the principle of people's rule in order to meet the newest challenges of modern America. Similarly, the prevalence of this populist ethic in the rural Ozarks complicates long-held views about rural working class hill folks as the nation's most militaristic people, always ready to fight their nation's wars. For good reason, many popular and scholarly accounts emphasize a patriotic tradition of soldiering among Ozarkers and other rural and small town Southerners, a traditional fighting spirit 
generally assumed to be rooted in the same folk culture that is defined by uniquely rugged individualism, self-reliance, and tenacious defiance against government authority. Ironically, though, some of the most vociferous challenges to federal intervention in the Ozarks during the early 20th century involved some rural people resisting the U.S. Selective Service's compulsory military conscription in 1917 and 18. To many rural Ozarkers, the Great War was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. Among these anti-war populists was Sam Faubus of Madison County, the father of Arkansas's notorious post-World War II era governor, Orville Faubus, a descendant, and by the way, Orville Faubus, Orville, Orville Eugene Faubus, he was he named him after a socialist presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs. Uh, a descendant of Scots-Irish immigrants who first settled in the Appalachian Mountains during the 1750s and who fought in the French and Indian and Revolutionary Wars, Faubus was a product of the backcountry's more radical populist ethic and was never shy about expressing his vision of a just government that would ensure economic and political equality. I'd rather be an honest peasant taking my living from the soil than to be a rich parasite living by others' toil, he once penned in a poem. Faubus was a member of the theologically ultra-conservative Combs Church of Christ, where, in fact, he first encountered socialist ideas and became an ardent supporter of Eugene V. Debs' presidential campaigns. As the war raged on in September 1918, local authorities arrested and jailed Faubus for distributing seditious literature and uttering numerous disloyal remarks concerning the conduct of the war. For Faubus and many other like-minded backcountry folks in the Ozarks, the U.S. war effort represented nothing more than greedy corporate interests manipulating to their economic advantage the uneven status quo of government power, all at the expense of honest, hard-working commoners like themselves. Some defiant Ozarkers organized to resist impressment into this war that they felt was inherently unjust. Armed resistance broke out, for instance, in Newton County's Cecil Cove, near the future home of Dogpatch USA, a theme park founded in 1967 and 68 based on Al Capp's popular hillbilly comic strip. There, amid nearly impenetrable mountains, ravines, and tangles of timber and underbrush that one newspaper said would fill a stranger's soul with trepidation, local authorities estimated that as many as 36 evaders and their family members had organized in armed defense and signed a covenant to resist the draft. After the potentially explosive affair ended peacefully and rather anticlimactically, the Kansas City Star weighed in uh, to comment with amusement that, quote, Cecil, so Cecil Cove, in the most remote fastness of the North Arkansas Ozarks, had baffled the United States government, where the Wilhelmstrasse had failed at the job. Bernstorff, Von Poppen, Dernberg, and their like couldn't fool Uncle Sam's agents, the newspaper remarked, but the boys in the Ozarks could and did. Framing the story with typical rural stereotypes, the paper commented that time swings far backward in this rugged and isolated community. The little log cabins that house families of eight and ten seem to belong to another era. Rifles of several stages, from the long-barreled muzzle loader to the most modern repeater, hung above the open fireplaces. Corn pone, corn-fed hogs, and sorghum molasses are the culinary standbys. Pa and Ma, and the majority of the kids, smoke corncob pipes, sometimes use snuff, and always are unerring spitters. The youngest of the family is considered deserving of a reprimand if he cannot hit the fireplace at ten paces. The mountain folk are suspicious of strangers, but are peculiarly hospitable. It is something akin to an insult if the wayfarer does not stop and partake in their hospitality, but he will find difficulty in getting questions answered. While the press emphasized an exceptional rural culture, local farmer preacher George Slape told reporters that the good book says, thou shalt not kill. We didn't want our boys taking nobody's life because it's contrary to the Bible and the good Lord's teachings. When a reporter asked why the evaders could violently take up arms against the authorities, Slape responded, the boys wasn't going to kill nobody unless they had to. It's different killing a man who tries to make you do wrong and killing somebody in war. Slate's son-in-law, a rural socialist, added that his family and many neighbors in the cove believed that the U.S. war effort was nothing more than a scheme 
for the benefit of them silk-hatted fellers up in New York. We don't want our boys fighting them rich fellers' battles and getting killed just to make a lot of money for a bunch of millionaires, they explained, while they own most of the country now. The memory of these anti-war sentiments in the rural Ozarks was most, scrubbed mostly clean after World War I, but this fiery draft resistance sprang from the same populist ethic that, on the one hand, demanded radical expressions of federal power to promote greater economic democracy, and yet, on the other, inspired skepticism and defiance of many federal interventions that intended to improve the human condition. So, how do we reconcile what may seem at first glance like rural working class Ozarkers' Jekyll and Hyde relationship with federal power, many pundits then and now seem content to lean on rural stereotypes and chalk up this seemingly bipolarity to unsophisticated and reactionary rural cultures. Others, like social scientist James C. Scott, tended to point the finger at distant, out-of-touch government bureaucracies and how their imperialistic, one-size-fits-all reform policies too often neglected local knowledge and customs, thus turning rural folks who might have otherwise welcomed assistance and new opportunities into obstinate rebels against the state. But I'm more convinced by historical explanations. While rural working class Ozarkers hoped for a populist moment to put political leaders in the driver's seat who were accountable to hard working common folks like themselves, they understood and often resented the fact that local and regional business elites control the status quo levers of federal power in their home areas. In fact, significant control of most federal programs, no matter how sincerely their creators sought to bring about change, was delegated from Washington to comfortable local elites in the region who typically had far less interest in helping small family farmers than improving business and agribusiness opportunities in the Ozarks. We do well to remember, for instance, that most federal G-men who were hell-bent on ridding moonshiners from the region were, in fact, well-heeled local businessmen and not outsiders, and that local draft boards during World War I, which made the big decisions on which locals received exemptions and which ones did not, were typically well-connected town businessmen, county politicians and large landowners, and not war department bureaucrats from Washington or even Camp Pike and Little Rock. Resistance to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's efforts to eradicate cattle ticks in the early 1900s is another great example of this intra-regional uh, conflict over federal power in the Ozarks. Prompted more by prosperous cattle growers who were beginning to raise imported purebred stock and call for an improved cattle industry in the South, the USDA launched a full-throttled program to wipe out tick fever, which was killing and inhibiting the weight gain of choice beef breeds. The USDA assumed at first that all cattle growers would welcome the program as a progressive measure, but soon found that smaller and poorer farmers were uh, reluctant to comply. Their native low-grade scrub cattle were largely immune to the disease, and the pains of rounding these animals up on the open range to drive them to dipping vats every week, every other week, was a costly and nearly impossible task. They also resented the per head flat tax that was levied to fund the state's portion of the federal program. And uh, so, so officials commenced hiring a cadre of inspectors, usually local elites who supported the program, and working with local sheriff's departments to force compliance. Some more obstinate smallholders determined to resist by blowing up cattle dipping vats, usually made out of concrete, um, and posting warning signs uh, for area inspectors to stop the program, and local elite Charles Jeffrey was gunned down by a concealed assassin in the hills of Independence County, south of Batesville. Jeffrey was the well-to-do owner of two farms and a blacksmith shop, and many of his neighbors who opposed tick eradication despised his federal authority to impose a burdensome program on them that only seemed to benefit a handful of well-connected elites in their communities. A Stone County man mocking what he viewed as the greed and corruption of the tick program, put it this way. This will be a lonesome old place to live when the tick eraters get all the tick eradicators get all the ticks eradicated. They may eradicate for a thousand years and there will not be any difference in the amount of ticks. The one tick thereafter is a big round tick. I call it a dollar. When they are all eradicated, then the ticks and money will be gone. The poor we have with us always. 
The populist ethic persisted among rural working class Ozarkers into the Great Depression of the 1930s. Many, even in the handful of Republican strongholds in the region that dated from the Civil War years, uh, hoped that FDR's and his liberal allies' New Deal would finally wield public power in ways that would advance economic democracy and opportunities for the rural working class. One rural Ozarker, for instance, penned a letter to the local newspaper in 1934 praising the New Deal's, quote, entirely new concept of the function and duty of government. Traditionally, our government was supposed to do little in time of depression except keep the tracks clear for such revival as private industry might be able to bring about, he wrote. But now its responsibility is to provide jobs for the people. While our federal or central government is growing stronger, he thought, it may be correct to say that we shall have to admit that the old Jeffersonian concept of government is no longer applicable. At least we're getting better adjusted to our environment, he concluded. He even wondered if it might work best for the federal government to take over America's public education system from the states and localities. Though most Ozarkers evidently supported the New Deal's general idea for a cooperative commonwealth, many backcountry folks soon felt the unevenness and limitations of many of its programs, which were, once again, mostly impl implemented locally by state and regional elites. New agricultural programs, consequently, tended to favor larger landhold landholders and agribusiness operators over smaller and poorer farmers. In December 1933, more than 200 hill farmers assembled for a meeting at the Searcy County Courthouse in Marshall, called by the area's Farmers Independent Association. According to the local paper, a heated discussion erupted when several in attendance voiced considerable dissatisfaction. Contending that the small farmer needs relief too, the group appointed a three-man committee to draft a petition aimed to awaken federal officials to, quote, the needs of the common people. Writing that same month, a rural school teacher in Searcy County, who also operated a small hill farm, complained that despite the fact that the New Deal has done many things, it had benefited the small hill farmer, but very little. Ozark's political elites mostly used their control over the new federal resources in the 1930s and 40s to promote industrial and agribusiness growth, brimming with confidence that such development would alleviate poverty and raise all boats with new business ventures and job creation. Congressman Clyde T. Ellis, representing northwestern and north central Arkansas's large third district, led the charge to tap federal resources for massive infrastructure projects. He and his supporters promised the dawning of a new day in Arkansas because the project should considerably stimulate business so that thousands of people will be giving, given work. This is a, a possum sent to him by some of his constituents. Ellis was the son of a Benton County farm family, a former teacher and school superintendent at Garfield, and had been an attorney in Bentonville. Once elected to Congress, he worked diligently to add provisions for the construction of a series of hydroelectric dams in the White River Basin uh, to the 1938 Flood Control Act. Inspired by the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, in Appalachia, and the extensive federal reservoir projects in the West, Ellis called for the creation of a White River Authority, or WRA, to promote not only flood control, but also uh, to provide public electrical power and spur economic development in the Ozarks. While the government for years has been spending millions out west and in Appalachia on such projects, dam supporters in Arkansas announced that this part of the southwest should now glory in the fact that it too is getting federal money. The far-reaching potentialities of this program now at last definitely launched are so extended, they extolled, and the benefits to come to the present and more to the future generations are well nigh incomprehensible. After Congress passed the flood control bill in 1938, the chairman of the Arkansas State Flood Control Commission boasted that, quote, it may be stated earnestly and candidly that Arkansas today is sitting in the lap of the gods. Congressman Ellis pressed on for a TVA model program in the Ozarks, declaring that its passage would mean the difference between poverty and prosperity in the region because it would provide for the agricultural industrial development of the White River Valley generate cheap electricity for every home in my district, both rural and urban, and provide jobs for everybody in my district who wants to work. The White River Authority never materialized, largely due to the powerful lobby of private utility companies that scoffed at what they claimed was a Soviet-style program, 
But after Ellis and other supporters of government-built dams in the Ozarks compromised to ensure that the private Arkansas Power and Light Company got the contract to distribute electrical power to customers from the federally constructed Norfolk Dam in Baxter County, the construction projects moved forward under the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. While the multi-million dollar federally funded construction work at Norfolk Bull Shoals, Greer's Ferry, and Beaver Dams and Lakes created good, decent-paying jobs for many rural working-class Ozarkers. While they lasted, the benefits were mostly temporary and ended once the projects were completed. Although the projects helped develop a thriving tourism industry in few towns like Mountain Home, Heber Springs, Eureka Springs, Rogers, and Bentonville that, that took on characteristics in keeping with the broader trends of America's post-World War II era uh, suburbanization and affluent society, the federal dam projects generally failed to live up to their designers' promises to revitalize and expand opportunities in rural communities. In fact, while dozens of smallholder families lost their family farms to the government's eminent domain to make room for the watersheds and were poorly compensated for their poor hill land, a grossly disproportionate amount of the new wealth and property uh, on and around these lakes and newly bustling towns was owned by a handful of local elites and a new and growing population of middle-class in-migrants from the urban Midwest. Indeed, the post-war years witnessed the rapid demise of rural communities and small farm economies of the Ozarks. Adding to the declension of family farming that had already begun during the 1940s, the percentage of Ozarkers employed in agriculture fell from 28.2% to 13.4% between 1950 and 60. The loss of opportunities for small farmers put many working families on the migrant trails. During the 1950s alone, the region experienced a net loss of 431,000 people. Serious poverty plagued thousands of rural Ozarkers who stayed behind. In 1959, the annual per capita, per capita income in the region stood at only 60% of the national average. Over 44% of Ozarks families had annual incomes of $3,000 or less in 1960 a poverty figure more than double the national average. Interestingly, the Ozarks' poverty rate was nearly 14% higher than the aggregate rate of Appalachia's, the symbol of rural poverty in the nation. Rural Ozarkers like Martha Wagner of Cleburne County continued to see an important role for government in helping rural communities. She had written Governor Sidney McMath to, quote, put in a plea for my good neighbors and friends, feeling that I just had to do something if I could for our people here because everybody is leaving here to hunt work. Her family and neighbors, she explained to the governor, will grow any kind and all kinds of vegetables from corn to pumpkins. If we had a big government canner here that would can and buy what they raise, Wagner thought, people could stay on their homes and have a good income and not have to leave and go to California or Michigan to work. Please, Mr. Governor, she, plead, she pleaded, uh, will you help us? so folks can keep their homes and at the same time help enable them to feed the world. The post-war leaders had determined that the future of rural communities would be best served by committing federal resources toward incentivizing corporate industrialization and agribusiness development rather than enhancing smallholder opportunities. Regional leaders in the Ozarks aimed to grow the undeveloped region into newfound prosperity. In 1966, federal State and local officials coordinated to create the Ozarks Regional Commission, or ORC, one of the five federal commissions authorized under Title V of the Public Works and Economic Development Act of 1965. <clears throat> the mountainous Ozarks seemed the logical choice to follow the government's bigger and better funded pilot program, the Appalachian Regional Commission. Despite conservatives like Barry Goldwater's claims that these regional development programs were dangerous Marxist schemes taken straight from the Soviet's playbook, evidence suggests that many rural Ozarkers initially held high hopes. Dozens, like Kenneth Hurst of Sharp County, where annual per capita income was only $723, and nearly 61% of the population was underemployed, wrote their political leaders for information about how their communities could benefit from the ORC's programs. But the lion's share of ORC programs, mostly industrial infrastructure projects, went to more prosperous growth center towns like Fayetteville and Harrison. The poorest counties in the Arkansas Ozarks, including Fulton, Sharp, Searcy, Stone, and Newton, did not receive a single dime. Promises that the economic growth from these larger towns would trickle out into the rural countryside were rarely kept. 
Some Arkansas leaders, like Dale Bumpers, cried that the ORC was nothing but a cruel hoax, arguing that far more federal dollars were needed to begin fulfilling its mission. But the work of historians who have examined the better-funded Appalachian program suggests that more money would probably have only led to even greater unevenness and rural decline in the Ozarks. Ozarkers were sorely disappointed. Many would have undoubtedly shouted, Amen, to a small-town newspaper editorial in Iola, Kansas in 1979 titled, Expensive Vanity, which blasted the federal government's, quote, conspicuous waste of the taxpayers' dollars for its overblown, expensive annual report, which will never be seen by the public the commission was served, created to serve. The editorial complained about the fancy pictures that appeared on 10 of the report's 24 pages, when a basic, inexpensive summary report on standard typewriter paper would have sufficed. Such a utilitarian economical approach would never do, however, because an opportunity to puff up the ORC staff and the elected officials would go unseized, it continued. It is only a small matter, only a few thousands of dollars were wasted, the editorial admitted, but it is another example of the government for the sake of government rather than government with the public in mind. When a copy of the newspaper reached the desk of one ORC staffer a few days later, he cussedly scribbled in the margins, well, you can't win an ass-kicking contest with a skunk. But when Ronald Reagan entered the White House with his budget-cutting acts in 1981, bent on slashing social spending and lowering taxes, it is doubtful that many rural Ozarkers objected too strongly when he felled the ORC. If the federal government's regional development scheme had disappointed most rural Ozarkers, its other war on poverty programs, which aimed more toward tackling poverty from the bottom up, ironically, provoked bitter resistance, a resentment, and loud defiance. <clears throat> but the impetus for resistance to federal power was very different this time. Unlike rural working class or work, working folks' grassroots defiance in the late 1800s and early 1900s, now it was typically <clears throat> local business elites who led more of an astroturf charge to defend local control and local heritage against federal power that better resembles the prevalence of anti-government attitudes in the region today. Local elites in the region initially responded with enthusiasm for the war on poverty programs. But they soon learned that the poverty programs would work differently than the ORC's economic development initiatives. While the ORC functioned as a literal partnership between local, state, and federal programs to channel designated federal resources for strategic development, the poverty programs aimed instead to spur community action at the grassroots and encourage low-income participation. Concerned primarily about the need to help poor blacks living under a southern political structure controlled by segregationists, the Lyndon Johnson administration originally designed its poverty programs to circumvent state and local political establishments in order to take assistance directly to the poor themselves. When it became clear then that community action would spoil Ozark's elite's expectations for local control, they quickly mobilized a stiff political resistance against what they viewed as federal intrusiveness. In June 1965, local officials in Pope, Yell, and neighboring counties in, the, in western Arkansas, with mountainous counties straddling the Arkansas River, formed the Arkansas River Valley Area Council, ARVAC, expecting the multi-county agency to capitalize on federal poverty grants in which localities were only required to put up 10% in matching funds. Local native Bob Adkinson, who was appointed executive director of ARVAC, remembered that initially the group leadership thought they were getting an economic development grant. We realized if Appalachia could get federal money, why couldn't we, said Adkinson. Local officials soon discovered, however, that the grant was really anti-poverty money and not economic development funding. When President Johnson's poverty program chief, Sergeant Shriver, arrived in Little Rock to finalize RVAC's first grant application, Adkinson recalled that the Washington official, quote, was met by a contingent of bankers and power people from the region, prompting Shriver to ask them where the poor folks were. Our leadership was thinking economic opportunity, Adkinson explained, and didn't realize focus was going to be solely on poverty. The requirements for community action and maximum feasible participation of the poor irritated most local elites who felt entitled to manage federal poverty programs in their areas as they saw fit. One of the most controversial programs was Volunteers in Service to America, or VISTA. 
which, modeled on JFK's International Peace Corps, deployed federally trained volunteers to America's needy areas with a mission to help energize poor people to improve their lives and communities. For those already in power, those who resisted change, writes one historian, Vista was nothing short of subsidized anarchy. Storms of protest arose almost immediately from the Arkansas business interests and in big agriculture. Mrs. Arthur Alexander of the Little Rock area wired Governor Faubus a telegram in May 1964 to warn him that, quote, you are losing hundreds of votes from the farmer, the planter, and the big and little uh, businessman by endorsing President Johnson's anti-poverty agenda. There are more of us than there are of the no work, all play group, she said. Instead of participating in wasteful government program, uh, programs, Alexander advised the governor to have jobless men register with the employment agency. After all, she and her husband were currently looking for tractor and transport drivers and men for other jobs. The Arkansas Farm Bureau's hostile opinion of the federal government's war on poverty, moreover, quickly prompted that powerful agribusiness lobbying organization to issue petitions requesting its removal from the state. Similarly, the executive vice president of the Arkansas Chamber of Commerce asked fellow members whether this great, big, prosperous, booming America of ours really needs to embark on an enormously costly and paternalistic spending spree to wipe out poverty among the less affluent of our society. Anyone who wants to go in business for himself finds the way open. And those who want to work, who want to make a life for themselves and their families, are doing it, he contended. Will the lavishing of taxpayers' dollars on all sorts of visionary schemes be likely to inculcate in such persons habits of industry and thrift and thus eliminate improvidence from the American scene? Many white Ozarkers came to view federal poverty programs as little more than handouts for undeserving blacks and radical youths. Negative publicity about anti-poverty projects and community action in black communities of eastern Arkansas spread to help color many white people's perceptions. White animosity raged in the Delta. In June 1969, an angry mob beat two Vista volunteers with coffee cups and other items at a cafe in Hughes, an assault that severed one of the victim's arteries. In November 1969, white planner T.H. Barker penned an angry letter to the Arkansas Gazette in which he claimed that Lee County did not acquire this poverty status until a group of bureaucrats decided we should wear this label. You and your kind have administered on an unsuspecting community. Milton Davis, another Lee County white, contended that this is nothing short of socialized anarchy. Not surprisingly, the White Citizens Council in Lee County also issued a statement condemning the, quote, NAACP, which it called the National Association for the Agitation of Colored People, the OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity, VISTA, which it called the Vipers in Subversion to America, and other troublemaking organizations. These same communist organizations, the council claimed, are the cause of the population ratio in Mariana to change to a black majority in recent years. Are you going to join with others now or after they burn your business or home or assault your wife or daughter, asked the Citizens Council. Even in the Ozarks, which by the mid-20th century was comparatively one of the whitest regions in the country, black activism stirred some controversy over federal poverty programs. One of the region's few black communities resided in East Fayetteville, near the university. When the war on poverty began, Bobby Morgan, a native son of the black neighborhood, became interested in helping to start a community action agency for his home county. He wrote the new Washington County Community Action Agency's first successful grant application for job training assistance in 1965. As federal money started to come in, however, Morgan remembered that local politics got involved. Despite the federal mandate for maximum feasible, feasible participation of the, of the poor, that's a mouthful, uh, before 1967, he claimed that only the power people had the power. Judges, mayor, sheriff. Morgan drafted one of the agency's largest funding proposals for a mobile social clinic to help serve all of Washington County, but especially the black community, with supplemental services such as medical care, library resources, and welfare information. The $480,000 grant, however, was used for other things by local political leaders, according to Morgan. Morgan himself became a bane of local political elites. He claimed that after he started a new program 
to provide meals for hungry children in Fayetteville, entrenched political and business elites, ordered county health inspectors to shut it down, baselessly citing unsafe and unsanitary conditions in the house it operated out of. By 1968, financial irregularities and suspicions of corruption finally led to an investigation of the elite-controlled Washington County Agency. One federal official noted in a memo in November 1968 that the agency is shot through with corruption, but the regional CAP is helpless to change this because of politics and the inability to prove anything illegal. To make matters worse, the official guessed that the VISTAs, the VISTA volunteers, will probably be asked to leave because of what they have exposed and because they were somewhat instrumental in bringing the investigation of the agency. Frustrated by his experience with the Washington County Agency, Morgan left to take a position with the OEO's Rural Training Center in Little Rock, but he remained committed to bringing change to his hometown and surrounding areas in northwestern Arkansas. Having come to believe that, quote, you'd either be with the power structure or against them, but couldn't be neutral, Morgan resolved to challenge elites' control over local affairs. Through the Rural Training Center, he helped spearhead a voter registration and education campaign and exposed rampant election fraud throughout the state. In rural Madison County, the home of former Governor Orville Faubus, Morgan claimed that he and his associates knocked the top off the, the, top off the Faubus thing of votes from dead people uh, after they spent two weeks to get names off tombstones and put them against county voter records. We started to penetrate with inf information of, about elected officials, he explained, and the power folks raised hell. Every so often, state troopers would come in and round us up, ask us to identify our, our people and hassle us about things, Morgan recalled. Intense conflict flared up in Washington County, especially between the small black community in Fayetteville and the local white political establishment. In the summer of 1969, black youths in Fayetteville, quote, rioted in the streets one night and a police car was set on fire. After that, remembered a VISTA volunteer working in Washington County, Many of our efforts were stemmied to the point that poverty reformers couldn't speak with the county judge or mayor. Several years later, when the feather-ruffling Morgan finally returned home to East Fayetteville, he claimed that grudge-bearing local elites had him arrested on trumped-up charges of weed possession and had him locked away in the county jail for four months. Black activism and its role in, war on poverty, in the war on poverty in Washington County, however, was an exception in the Arkansas Ozarks in a region with a white population well in excess of 90%, and where most counties had no black residents at all, the civil rights struggle rarely figured directly into the affairs of anti-poverty programs. Nevertheless, the public image associated with the war on poverty and its links to African Americans and other so-called radicals' fights for civil rights left a strong impression about the program's intentions and provided local elites with powerful ammunition to help discredit the federal reform efforts among rural whites. Earl Evans, the African-American director of the OEO's Rural Training Center in Little Rock, regretted that 98% of the white people don't understand the poverty program, mistakenly thinking it was only for blacks. For their part, well-meaning poverty reformers typically posed a weak challenge to local elites' highly publicized assaults on the federal government's wasteful and dangerous programs. Like many of the earliest outside reformers who went to work in Appalachia, most poverty warriors who arrived in the rural Ozarks primarily aimed to tackle the region's supposedly pathological culture and alter the value system of the mountain people. Many reformers believed that the mountain south's problems could be mostly boiled down to rural people, quote, perpetuating their own impoverishment by clinging to outdated customs, values, and traditions. This assumption effectively placed the burden of poverty on the poor themselves and ignored its real uh, sources namely the destruction of the region's smallholder economy and corporate industrialization's grossly uneven consequences. It also tended to offend the proud, hardscrabble people reformers programs aimed to help. Unlike leaders of the farmers' organizations who had helped mobilize poor and middling backcountry folks to challenge the status quo in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 1960s and 70s poverty reformers remained unable to connect with the rural dispossessed in order to rekindle a populist grassroots defiance against economic inequality and dominance by local elites. Poverty reformers' recollections of culture shock when they entered the region illuminate their prevalent attitudes and assumptions about the rural poor they came to help. For example, when Vista volunteer Anna Gottlieb of Illinois found uh, out she had been assigned to Arkansas, she, quote, seriously thought of leaving the program altogether. 
To me, she explained, Arkansas was the backwards of backwards and just a place where you were born and stuck. Federal poverty reformers also missed other opportunities to rekindle the old tradition of populist activism in the rural Ozarks by neglecting or disparaging the region's religious culture. Indeed, a significant gap between the rural disinherited and more affluent middle-class Christians remained visible in the Ozarks during the second half of the 20th century, and remnants for a potential revival of populist working-class religion, religious dissent, uh, may have survived. One poverty activist observed the socioeconomic divisions entrenched in the religious community of the Pope County locale where he worked during the 1960s. As for the most prominent church there, he noticed that, quote, members were mostly not from low-income families, and some looked down on the low-income families as trash beneath their feet. Another reformer confronted the managing editor of the Arkansas Methodist uh, newspaper about why there, there seemed to be such a well-defined line between the haves, what he called the good Christian folks, as he uh, sarcastically referred to them, and the have-nots in Arkansas's mainstream church environment. The editor responded to the, his, this inquiry by saying, quote, well, we've had to work for what we have, prompting a frustrated Lewis to simply scribble in his journal, come on, lady. Yet, while poverty reformers often work successfully with African-American churches to promote grassroots community activism in American cities, they proved unable, or perhaps more accurately, unwilling, to connect with religious sentiments among rural whites in the Ozarks. In fact, the religious, religious fundamentalism of rural Ozarkers, as one federal poverty worker in the region noted, typically figured high on reformers' list of cultural problems that had to be overcome. Powerful conservative Christians in the region, meanwhile, worked diligently and far more successfully to forge a new popular climate of religious dissent, one increasingly directed, not as in the past, against greedy corporate elites but now at abusive liberals and a meddling federal government. Churchgoers in this new Ozarks heard fewer sermons and read less in faith-based literature about the sins of material greed, oppression by rich rulers, and the blessedness ascribed by Jesus Christ to the poor and those who toil. Instead, they heard and read more about the imminent dangers of America's liberal-induced cultural crises and path to godlessness. Today's anti-government political culture in the Ozarks is rooted far more in these later upheavals of the 1960s and 70s than in the older populist culture that inspired rural resistance to federal efforts to suppress moonshining, draft country boys in a military service during World War I, and enact so-called progressive improvements in agriculture. In fact, the politics of anti-government defiance today seeks to tear down many of the same federal powers that the region's rural forefathers had helped to create. Many small farmers and working class Ozarkers, I think, uh, must have rolled in their graves recently. For instance, when billionaire real estate tycoon Donald Trump and his allies in Congress slashed taxes for corporations and the rich. The smallholder society that gave birth to and once sustained rural Ozarkers' populist defiance has now been extinct for the better part of 50 years. This fact, especially when considered with other changes that have been transformed in the Ozarks since the mid-1900s, may seem to indicate that the likelihood is slim to none for a resurgence in the foreseeable future of a populist ethic that again sees an important role for government in helping to curb and mitigate inequalities, including local unevenness. The ever-strengthening anti-government political culture in the region today seems to, so, that seems so fixated on the blunders of Washington might certainly suggest so. But if history tells us anything, it is that things do change, even if they may go unnoticed or misunderstood, Moreover, we must also realize that rural people and their experiences were not all that exceptional, but actually held much in common with non-farm working people elsewhere in America, even if they at times failed to recognize those similarities. Just as the region in the mid-20th and early 21st centuries is so very different from what it was in the late 1800s and early 1900s, I would just about bet the farm that someday in the future historians will look back on our own times and also say, this ain't your granddaddy's Ozarks anymore. As the great historical prophet and country music artist Tracy Lawrence sang in his number one hit in 1996, time marches on and everything changes. Thank you.